asbestos, it's an April 16th if I'm not mistaken, and they say that if they want to be living uh, examples of people who are working with asbestos, who are not going to die because of asbestos. Yeah, it's, it's so a it's common trick by yeah, the yeah. industry people. Mm -hmm. They do the same with uh, mercury as well. Mm -hmm. That it's safe, you can play with it. But the best would be to see when will they uh, develop this disease. Usually it comes from mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Now after the toxicity group, uh, we're going to start to talk about the laws and the regulations uh, that we have concerning asbestos. I will be presenting the general overview, the historical uh, data and the health concerns and the regulations from the past till today. Then my uh, group mate Damodaran will talk about worker exposure standards and uh, my other group mate Samanesh will speak about the uh, demolition standards and the, and the waste, uh, waste, the management. waste management. Yes. So a little outline about what I'm going to speak about. The first of all, I want to speak about the historical background and the regulations. I know a lot of people have spoken about the history, but I will just add some more details so that we can understand the flow of the uh, events and how we came to understand that asbestos is related to cancer and why do we need to regulate it. Uh, then I'm going to speak about the modern regulations and I will give examples of two countries, the United States and Australia, uh, and then an Armenian overview. Historical background, as we know, uh, asbestos has been in the human culture uh, since 4,500 years ago. Uh, as uh, Shabita mentioned yesterday, that the kings used to uh, have clothes for their uh, tables, tablecloth that were uh, fireproof and they could, uh, for sterilizing it, they could just throw it into the uh, fire and sterilize it. And, uh, but uh, until the 19th century, asbestos was used only for the nobility and the nobility only used it. Then in the 19th century, uh, due to the uh, economic uh, boom and the, 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 uh, the people discovered uh, petroleum and the uh, industry began, asbestos uh, industry took a large scale. Uh, and the first mine and the industry that began was in 1870, that was in Thetford Hills of Quebec in Canada. And then in the 1880s, asbestos production began in the Urals of the Russian Empire, which then developed, as we know, and the USSR became one of the biggest uh, producers and exporters of uh, asbestos, unfortunately, until now. In 1893, mining of asbestos began in South Africa and in uh, 1899, start of asbestos production in the United States after the discovery of the large deposits in the Belvedere Mountains. Uh, now a little bit of history of health concerns and regulations. Uh, before the 20th century, the Greeks and the Romans observed in the slaves who worked in, uh, in weaving of asbestos, they observed some sickness uh, of the lungs. Uh, then, uh, in the modern era, we can see early reports from Britain, uh, which came uh, from the in chief inspector of factories. In, in 1898, Lucy Dean, who was a uh, civil servant and uh, uh, she was the first female uh, factory inspector, she demonstrated that uh, asbestos was actually linked with uh, uh, health sicknesses and lung diseases. Then the death of 50 asbestos, during that time again, due to the death of 50 asbestos workers in France triggered studies on the health effects of asbestos in France. Uh, in 1899, Dr. Uh, Harry Murray confirmed after, uh, after a post-mortem on a young asbestos uh, worker that uh, the presence of asbest in the lungs of the, that young uh, worker was due to asbestos and the disease and the cause of the death was due to asbestos. In the early 1900s, asbestos workers in the United States and Canada were declined life insurance from insurance companies because uh, they didn't know, the medical community didn't know what caused th their death and they didn't investigate uh, much into their death but the insurance companies saw that the people who were working in asbestos companies had higher death rates than the others who were working in other uh, industries. That is why they declined them in, uh, life insurance. 
Uh, unfortunately, in these times also, uh, the, in the United States, which is, uh, was mentioned in the, uh, in the literature that was comical, that the doctors and the, the, the industry itself, they, always, they were the ones who were doing the reports and the studies and they always undermined the effect of asbestos to keep it suppressed and not available to the public, the findings. In the 1920s and the 30s, uh, it was, uh, in Britain especially, it was very uh, uh, essential, the case of Nelly Kirchhoff, Dr. William uh, Edmund Cook, who was uh, an, a pathologist. He was the one who looked into the case of Nelly Kirchhoff. She was a 33-year-old uh, factory worker who had fibrosis and she died from it. Uh, Dr. Kier, uh, Dr. Uh, Cook looked into this case and he was the one who made it more public and widespread recognition of the, uh, of the health effects of asbestos came to life. After that, the Merweather report uh, uh, came, uh, started, uh, came, sorry, uh, which was named after the author of um, Merweather. This was a large public health uh, investigation that examined 360 asbestos uh, textile workers and found that a quarter of them suffered from pulmonary fibrosis. These findings triggered uh, some of the improvements in regulations in the United Kingdom at that time. One of them was, for example, the industrial hygiene standards were improved, medical examinations were conducted for uh, factory workers, and the British Workers' Compensation Act was also introduced. Then came the, in the 40s and the 80s, asbestos use and production flourishes. Due to uh, the, as we know, asbestos had an application of, uh, in more than 3,000 uh, uh, products that we had at that time. And uh, due to the, uh, the, the asbestos uh, industry people, they didn't uh, make their findings uh, uh, apparent to the public. In the 1980s, public health concern arises on the exposure of, uh, to asbestos and the Health Effects Institute some discussion to evaluate lifetime cancer risks of asbestos. Modern day. Uh, currently, uh, according to the uh, International Ban of Asbestos Secretariat, 55 countries have completely banned the use of all forms of asbestos. Uh, I would like to say that uh, Egypt is one of that countries who has banned asbestos, fortunately. And, uh, uh, but there are developed countries like, for example, the United States and Canada, who still use and they haven't completely banned the use of asbestos. Uh, then came the international conventions. One of them is the Basel Convention and the Rotterdam Convention. Well, basically, under the Annex 1 of the uh, Basel Convention, uh, which the legal name, uh, of the formal name of the Basel Convention was uh, the control of transboundary movement of hazardous waste and their disposal. Uh, this was a treaty to reduce the movement as hazard of hazardous waste from uh, countries to countries and specifically uh, waste products from developed countries to less developed countries and the convention was to uh, empower or to help developing countries to better manage and to better, uh, better uh, 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 treat their hazardous and other waste that they generate. Then came in 2004 the Rotterdam Convention. The Rotterdam Convention, which was formally named the Rotterdam Convention on the Prior Informed Consent Procedure for Certain Hazardous Chemicals and Pesticides in International Trade. This treaty on shared responsibility is related to the import of hazardous chemicals and it promotes open exchange of information and calls on exporters of hazardous chemicals to use proper labeling including directions on safe handling and inform informing the purchasers of any known uh, have restrictions or bans. So how is asbestos regulated in the United States? As I mentioned before, the United States remains one of the few developed nations to not completely ban asbestos. Um, the management of asbestos in the United States is carried out by the EPA primarily, which is the Environmental Protection Agency, and OSHA, which is the Occup Occupational Safety and Health Administration, which my colleague Damodran will speak further about the Occupational Safety and Health Administration in detail. 
Uh, now, some of the laws and, uh, uh, and regulations that have been passed to, uh, to, uh, to uh, control the asbestos was one of the examples was the Asbestos Hazard Emergency Response Act. This act basically uh, uh, required the EPA to make the regulation requiring local education agencies like schools or universities to inspect their schools and their, uh, their uh, institutional uh, institutions or uh, educational institutions for asbestos materials and to prepare asbestos management plans and to perform asbestos response actions to prevent or reduce asbestos hazards. Then came the, uh, the Asbestos Information Act. The Asbestos Information Act basically was that the law helped to provide transparency and identify the companies making certain types of asbestos containing products by requiring manufacturers to report production to the EPA. Uh, then the Asbestos School Hazard Abatement Reauthorization Act. This reauthorization act basically enabled the schools and the universities to ha have better uh, access to loans and funds from the banks so that if they wanted to renovate, if they wanted to uh, exclude or to clean up the asbestos that they had in their places uh, effectively. And uh, then the Clean Air Act came, which Samantha will talk about it, I guess, right? Yeah. Uh, it was signed in 1963. This uh, Clean Air Act was basically uh, that the, the law defines the EPA's responsibility for protecting and improving the nation's air quality and includes national emission standards for hazardous air pollutants, including asbestos. The Safe Drinking Water Act, signed in 1974, which Karim talked about yesterday, uh, it ensures the quality of drinking water and the EPA sets standards for drinking water quality and oversees the states and the cities and the water suppliers uh, that they adhere to the uh, emission st standards that uh, it is set by the EPA. The Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, C-E-R-C-L-A, this is also known as the Superfund which enacts to uh, address uh, abandoned hazardous waste sites like factories and other waste sites that might, might contain waste or hazardous material, how to uh, clean them up and, uh, um, and to uh, contain it as we have seen, for example, in the Bunker Hill site that Ian had produced, uh, produced, presented to us. Uh, com the CERCLA had uh, saying that. And also there is a very nice uh, law in the United States stating that all the banks that uh, give out loans to buy houses or real estates, uh, they sh the, the buyer or the person who demands the loan should have uh, evidence that the house that he wants to buy is uh, asbestos free, is radon free, is lead, mercury, arsenic free. Now, uh, asbestos, uh, asbestos is regulated in the United States, and we have over here there are some examples of the banned products under the Toxic Substance Control Act. For example, you can see here the colony paper over there, the roll board, the commercial paper, the specialty paper, and the flooring felt. These are all banned in the United States. But there are also some examples of asbestos materials which are not banned in the United States. For example, the cement corrugate sheet and the cement flat sheet, clothing of uh, workers which, which are uh, subjected to, uh, to high uh, temperatures of fire, the pipeline wrap, over there you can see, the roofing felt, and the cement shingles, and the automotive parts, especially disc brake, brake pads, drum brake pads, and the automatic, automatic transmission components. Uh, Australia is one of the countries that had a long battle with asbestos. They were once one of the uh, biggest importers and uh, one of the be be biggest utilizers of asbestos. Uh, for, uh, after a long battle with asbestos and a lot of studies which suggested uh, health risks of asbestos, crude, uh, crucido light was banned in 1967, amosite was banned in 1989, and asbestos was completely banned in 2003. Right now, currently, it is illegal to store, sell, install, or use any products containing asbestos, and even they would have, for the people who would uh, uh, use asbestos or sell or trade in them, there is also, uh, they would have a penalty 
uh, with, even with going to jail. The ban, uh, however, the ban does not cover asbestos materials which have already been in, uh, have already in, are already in use. Like, for example, the houses which were built during the 50s or the 60s, they are still uh, uh, in, in use, uh, but they have very uh, strict rules on the maintenance and the uh, the maintenance and the cleanup and everything, or the renovation. If anybody wants to do renovation, there are specifically trained groups which should come and uh, check your house for asbestos and clean it for you. Now coming to Armenia. Armenia has ratified the Basel Convention and was a member of the Basel Convention and the Rotterdam Convention. Uh, but unfortunately until now there is no uh, official statement on the ban of asbestos and we don't have any data for the ban. Under the Basel Convention, Armenia wasn't, was not supposed to import any asbestos from uh, countries. And in 2009 and 2010, we can see that, according to the WHO, uh, that Armenia has imported 200 tons of chrysotile asbestos. Uh, roofing slates in rural areas mostly contain asbestos, as Shogar discussed yesterday, and the roofing slate manufacturer in Ararat Mars, which uses asbestos with cement to make the roof tiles. Uh, old pipes and slabs used for heating often contain asbestos here in Armenia. Fortunately, we have got some news that they have started in certain parts without a national decree, without a national uh, governmental decree or anything to change these pipes with uh, uh, polyethylene pipes. Uh, uh, further investigation should be done in that area to see that if this was a governmental uh, uh, decree. Existing asbestos materials and waste remain a problem, like we saw in, for example, in the, the nearby the, uh, the factory, there were asbestos lying over there, and in the village as well, there was asbestos flying over everywhere. Now, some of my recommendations that uh, Armenia should ban all import of asbestos and, and uh, adhere to its ratification of the 1992 uh, 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 Basel Con uh, Convention and ban all import of asbestos and the, the export. Uh, stop the manufac manufacturing, stalling, uh, storing, selling and installing of asbestos containing products and encourage the use of alternative products like, for example, the polyethylene pipes and the other insulation materials that Carol Rice had mentioned in her presentation. Uh, implement a proper maintenance guideline, which uh, until now we haven't found any guidelines for the proper maintenance of asbestos, although we have a lot of asbestos used in Armenia, and pass a law on the proper of handling of waste pro uh, and, uh, of waste and uh, garbage. Thank you. Question? Raja, do you think if Armenia enacts a law on how to handle the waste, will it help? Well, uh, currently there are laws uh, which are not enforced much. In the, for example, we can see uh, on the uh, uh, construction sites. Mm -hmm. Right now they are closing it, they are fencing the place, they are trying to conceal the dust and everything, the demolition, uh, but there is no specific thing concerning asbestos. There is nothing, uh, no information how are they regulating asbestos. If there is certain rules, certain uh, uh, emission standards set for each and every toxic material or every any, any hazardous material, I guess people will adhere to it and if it is uh, enforced by the law. By the, uh, law. What could be done to enhance enforcement of such laws? Uh, well, for example, there should be uh, a governing body which should uh, go inspect randomly a, uh, waste sites or, uh, or uh, factories or uh, construction sites randomly they should go and check and see if there are any waste materials which are lying over there or that company which has contracted and is doing the renovation or the construction is adhering to the laws of Armenia and they have no emissions that would be the perfect thing
I have a small question about the Canada. So yesterday, Shubita told that uh, in Canada the usage is banned, and today you said that they keep using it. Could you like No, uh, yes. Uh, actually, in Australia as well, it's not completely banned. There are some certain uh, products which are still in use. And for, as we saw, like, people cannot like, uh, uh, provide money to change uh, their roof tiles and everything because it depends a lot of money to do that, all that renovation and the cleaning up process. So in Canada, it's the same situation. They are, uh, they are manufacturing asbestos, they're uh, exporting it, but they're not lo uh, using it in, uh, in, uh, in Canada. But they have buildings that they have, uh, for like America, they have the tiles and roof uh, slates which are uh, from uh, asbestos, which are still in use. Thank you. A comment? If you go to uh, High building in Yerevan, and you look around to the roofs of other buildings, you will see lots of asbestos tiles. So it's not just typical for rural Armenia, mm -hmm. and they are in pretty bad shape. I can speak about my building, for example. I live in Kievia. They came and they changed the, the roof, they put a metal roof now, but all the asbestos tiles. They had uh, they they threw it inside the roof and whenever you want to go out you should press on them and you inhale all that dust. You know, sometimes it's, if it's intact it's not you know dangerous, but if, if you start changing it then it becomes very dangerous. Yeah, especially here in Armenia because uh, we are a low income country and uh, a clean up process. Big, big scale, it's not possible. So the best thing is to do is to have laws for the proper maintenance of asbestos because if it is properly maintained, there is no health risk. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we have the I'm going to present you the global view of occupational regulations on asbestos. The aim of my presentation is to provide a detailed overall information about the occupational uh, regulations uh, globally as well as uh, the Armenian view. To start with, I will begin with uh, the ILO, which is the International Labour Organization. Then uh, the presentation will be proceeded with uh, OSHA, the Occupation Safety and Health Administration of USA. Then we will proceed with the uh, European regions of uh, WHO. Then uh, based on the experience from the global uh, uh, organizations, uh, I will give some recommendations for the Armenian. So this unique uh, international organization called as ILO, the International Labour Organization, was created in 1919 at Peace Conference as a part of Treaty of the Service to protect the rights and safety of the workers. So the principal function of this organization is to establish the international labor and social measurement, international standards through drafting and adopting the conventions. So totally, if you see, uh, there are 185 countries uh, included in the, as the member states, including Armenia. So uh, news released by ILO in January 10, 2006 estimated that Every year, 100,000 people die uh, due to work-related asbestos uh, exposure worldwide. They also estimated that cancer due to asbestos will kill over uh, uh, from 60,000 to 100,000 people in uh, Canada over the next two decades. In USA, more than 20,000 people die each year due to asbestos-related uh, deaths. If you take Russia, which is the topmost producer of asbestos in Russia, Every year, 10,000 people uh, die due to asbestos-related uh, lung diseases. Then China, as uh, yesterday uh, colleagues mentioned that, China is the topmost user of asbestos in China. Every year, 110,000 people die due to asbestos-related uh, diseases. So in 1986, ILO uh, established few recommendations on asbestos uh, industries. 
The recommendations specifically focusing on mining and milling uh, industries, the manufacture of materials containing asbestos, the use and application of uh, products which contains asbestos, then uh, the demolition and repair of plants containing asbestos, and they also uh, suggested the recommendation for transportation, storage and handling of asbestos containing materials. Then uh, they have uh, focused on activities involving a risk of exposure to airborne asbestos dust. So, to achieve the goals of ILO recommendation, they split the responsibility into four categories. For example, the member states, which are the federal or state governments of each member state. Then the competent authority, this is usually the scientific committee or institutions which, private, which assist employers as well as governments to proceed with the ILO recommendations. Then the employer, the most part of the responsibility is given to the employer and the employees. So the member states, they should consider the recommendations given by the ILO and they should allocate required resources to amend this convention. The competent authority, they should review the measures in collaboration with the employers as well as the employees organization. Then the employer, they should use all appropriate measures to protect, prevent and control asbestos exposure to their employees. Then the employees, I can say that this is the right to each and every employee to follow the safety measures provided by the competent authority as well as by the employees. So let us uh, discuss a little about each and every uh, individual agencies. For example, the competent agency, they should ensure the exposure to asbestos prevented by adequate engineering measures including uh, workplace hygiene. Then they have to provide scientific assessment to the uh, government bodies to prohibit or authorize certain types of asbestos. They also should suggest substitute to reduce the burden of uh, asbestos, uh, asbestos exposure. Then they can prescribe safety information manuals such as guidelines about asbestos to employers as well as to the uh, workers, uh, uh, workers. They can provide authorization for demolition of asbestos uh, containing structures. So the employer, uh, they should establish a program for prevention and control of uh, asbestos exposure among the workers. They should, uh, they should provide technical protective appliances to prevent the release of asbestos dust into the workplace air. And they should prohibit uh, spraying of all types of asbestos in and around the workplace. And they have to label each and every product which contains asbestos uh, material. They should provide data sheet about the asbestos and its hazards. And they have to set an exposure limit, uh, such as uh, uh, usually it is 8 hour day and, uh, and 40, 8 hour day and 40 hour week to recognize the method of sampling and measurement technique. And they have to periodically monitor the installation uh, equipments, ventilations, and protective appliances. And they have to keep the working environment very clean to reduce the sedimentation of asbestos dust on the workplace. They have to give adequate respiratory uh, protective equipment as well as special coatings to their uh, employees at free of cost. Uh, those uh, uh, equipments and coatings should not be taken outside the industry to prevent the exposure to the environment. And uh, they have to provide the adequate facilities for showering, clothing and washing for the employees. So this is a specific, an example of instrument which monitors the air, air dust, uh, air asbestos dust. This should be kept in each uh, industries. <laughs> so you can see the employees, they are wearing uh, specialized uh, respiratory equipment as well as clothing. This is another example. So surveillance system. So each uh, employer should uh, uh, should have a pre-assigned as well as periodic medical uh, examination to their employees. All services must be free and done during their working hours. And they have to uh, they have to take a chest X-rays and well, as well as uh, lung uh, uh, X-rays to identify the early indications of asbestos related diseases. In any case, if there is a fine, clinical findings, the, the employee should be given proper treatment measures as well as the workplace of the employee should be changed to some other place. And the health status of each and every uh, individual worker should be informed to, their, uh, to them. 
and the confidentiality should be maintained in a decent manner and the records which are maintained uh, by the employer should be uh, given to the competent authority uh, whenever necessary. So the employers also have the surveillance system of concentration of airborne asbestos dust in the workplace and they have to uh, keep the records of exposed level of asbestos among workers and the records should not uh, should be kept for not less than 30 years and uh, the access of records to the inspection authorities such as competent authority as well as to the workers and their representatives should be made available. So this is just uh, the ILO has uh, suggested each and every member states uh, without any discrimination they should at least consider their recommendation to pass the uh, regulations in their asbestos industries to prevent the exposure among the workers. So the competent authority, they should promote the training of all the individuals engaged in asbestos industries and they have to make suitable guidelines to the employees as well as employees as I already mentioned. The employer should make sure that the, all the employees are well trained and educated about the asbestos exposure and its hazards. The workers' organizations, they should uh, have the, the very good coordination and cooperation with the employer to prevent the in the program uh, training programs to prevent the asbestos exposure as well as hazards among the workers. Unfortunately, uh, among 185 member states, only 35 uh, members uh, member states uh, have ratified the recommendations of ILO to date. So we are done with uh, ILO. Uh, now I am going to present the OSHA, which is Occupational Safety and Health Administration, the only uh, federal agency which may, which lift all the American uh, industries uh, nightmare. So, a history about OSHA. For example, the OSHA was a part of Occupational Safety and Health Act. This is the law. So, the it was created in 1970 to prevent the workers from being killed or harmed at the workplace. It required the employees to provide safe workplace to the employees, as thus they provide the safe and healthy workplace to the employees. So the OSHA sits and enforces protective workplace safety and health standards to the employees. They also provide information, training and assistance to the employees as well as employees. They, they affiliate National Institute of uh, Safety, National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health which is shortly called as NEOS. So this is uh, this can be taken as an example of co competent authority. So the NEOS, uh, NEOS is the only uh, um, committee which gives scientific basis of various regulatory activities of uh, OSHA. So according to OSHA, asbestos fibers means any fiber which is more than 5 micrometer in length, which has 3 is to 1 aspect ratio which is observed under 400 magnitude polarized microscope. So the recommendations or standards uh, given by the OSHA are applicable to shipyard industry, construction industry and general industry. So this is a uh, history about OSHA's standards, how they started and uh, right now what are they doing. For example, uh, very interesting news is in 1971 they, they set a standard of uh, Five to, sorry, uh, five fibers per centimeter cube. This is the uh, maximum uh, level of air, uh, asbestos dust in the air in the workplace. You know, an interesting thing. Right now, they achieve 0.1 fibers per centimeter cube. So, to achieve this, they took 30 years, but, uh, almost. So uh, in 71, I said that they, uh, they set a target of 5 fibers uh, per centimeter cube. In 72, they reduced the 5 fibers into uh, 2 fibers per centimeter cube, which could be achieved in 1976, and they achieved it. Then uh, many publications were done by uh, OSHA as well as by NIOSH. So in uh, 1994, they set a target of permissible exposure limit standard amounted to 0, 0 0.1 fibers per centimeter cube, which is right now in force.
Then another interesting thing is OSHA's inspection. So uh, the inspection, usually during inspection, the air levels are measured during uh, measure. So the inspections are not pre-scheduled. They can be taken place at any time to the any industries. So the, uh, if the employees found to uh, found that if they have higher airborne asbestos dust uh, than the OSHA standard, the they they are subject to monetary fines, fines which which is usually uh, range from hundred dollars to thousand dollars. If they violate the rules again and again. The government will shut down the industry on their uh, own. So you can see other uh, agencies in uh, USA. For example, so far uh, OSHA has uh, has been regulating the standards for uh, factories and industries. There are another uh, there is another uh, agency called as Mine Enforcement and Safety Administration (MSHA). This uh, regulates the safeguard of. Uh, uh, Safety and work, work of safety and health of minus American minus, and right now they have the standard of 0.15 per centimeter cube, which is equal to the OSHA standard. So that's all about OSHA. Then we move on to the European region. For example, uh, Russian Federation uh, in 2007, Ministry of Health issued an order to develop a national program for eliminating the asbestos-induced diseases. But no formal process have been done till date. They have given new training materials to the employees as well as ins inspect inspecting authorities. The interesting thing is a retrospective study was done in Russia to review uh, the journals, the scientific papers which were published from 1902 to 2010. So based on the review, they came to the conclusion that all types of asbestos can be the harmful to human health. So this is. Uh, a good sign for the future uh, regulations. You can see Belarus also has a registration, like on the Croatia, they have a very good health surveillance of workers exposed uh, uh, since 1957. They have very good follow up programs. Then Armenia. So, in Armenia, Ministry of Labor and Social Issues, or the social issues. And state level inspector are two author, authorized, authorized uh, agencies to regulate the occupational safety of uh, industries. The occupational regulations are either depend on old Soviet regulations or they, are, they simply don't exist. The lack of public awareness about the occupational safety is another problem. I, I have found that in 2006, a project started by USAID. Uh, uh, the, called, the project name is Social Protection System Strengthening Project. They have mentioned that occupational safety and labor code implementation is one of their priorities. It was already uh, over. It, it, it took place from 2006 to 2011. But I couldn't find any information about the asbestos regulations in that uh, uh, project. So today, uh, today uh, asbestos, asbestos is not regulated in Armenia by legislation. So Armenia, as Herak already mentioned that they ratified already the Rotterdam, uh, Rotterdam Convention. Convention. So the problem is there is a difficulty in obtaining data uh, about mesothelioma as well as other lung uh, diseases caused by uh, asbestos, lack of evidence on exposure and risk. So based on the global experience, uh, I am giving some recommendation to the uh, Armenia. So we can initiate the scientific research for the risk assessment of asbestos exposure and its hazards. So based on the evidence, suggestions can be uh, given to the authorized agencies such as Ministry of Health uh, to promote the regulations. So we can get uh, support from the international organizations again such as PSA, OSHA to promote the regulations in Armenia. We can maintain, a, we can start and maintain a health, sur health surveillance system to monitor the current employees in the existing factories as well as we should monitor the health status of already retained workers. For example, Shogar mentioned that right now there are six employees in the factory which they, they visited and previously the factory had uh, 140 employees. So those employees have to be monitored uh, and their family members also should be monitored. So the information and education to current workers about the safety measures and their 
uh, right should be uh, given. only from the other countries, but in Armenia, I think as uh, my colleagues informed that there are no data about asbestosis as well as mesothelioma. Even the doctors, they don't aware that asbestos cause uh, lung diseases. And uh, when they did the, my colleagues did the field visit, they approached as anesthesiologist, right? Mm -hmm. Even he couldn't give the scientific uh, data about the mesothelium and lung disease. He simply said that you can see the uh, air fumes which may cause the lung diseases. So we should initiate some scientific research about the asbestos exposure as well as the hazards. So that only we can, based on the uh, evidence in Armenia only, we can uh, start the recommendations of the Could you please uh, explain or just uh, elaborate on how ILO checks whether uh, countries follow their standards or do they have any mechanisms? Actually, uh, they, suggest, they, they suggest the member states to follow their recommendation, but they don't have any uh, like uh, inspecting authority in each and every country to monitor the uh, function. They just recommend? They just recommend. And about the uh, OSHA, so you say about their inspections and they, they are checking the working conditions. Do they have the right to check the um, health status of the workers and how they uh, ch check the health of the workers? Yeah, the, the, that's mainly done by NIOSH, mm -hmm. the National Institute, of, uh, National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. So they are the competent authority, they have the evidence about the health status of the workers. They can suggest the OSHA about their health status. And a small question, I'm just wondering why you cut Armenian map. Oh. <laughs> What's the rest? <laughs> <laughs> Which countries? Mm -hmm. Because the requirements are different in different countries. Yes, but uh, I took it from uh, internet, but I don't this know. This site is actually from the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. So the Oracle, I can assume it's from the United Kingdom. It, it was taken from Oracle Asbestos, asbestos uh, The Oracle Asbestos, they are the private agency in UK. They are maintaining the cleanup activities in the UK. So that uh, website I can take. Yeah, they look like more uh, Western or Northern European pictures. Mm -hmm. Thank you. to you about the regulations that is been going on globally and what can we do for Armenia. So I'm going to follow it and I'm going to talk specifically about the demolition, demolition recommendations and regulations. 
So while Hiraj was talking, he was telling that asbestos are being controlled by two agencies. One is EPA and other one is OSHA. Now Dhamma explained about OSHA and I'm going to talk about EPA agency. I was thinking of how to frame this because when I saw the literatures and article, at first I felt like a law student. There was too many information, very hard to concise, but I hope that this will be informative to you. And I'm going to take EPA standard as a as a base, as an example, to explain what they do with demolishment of each um, asbestos waste materials, and I'm going to compare and recommend if that could be done in Armenia. So let's go forward. So should demolishing of asbestos be regulated? So I think um, few informations can help us to understand that EPA lists that asbestos is a hazardous air pollutant. And it is a non-human carcinogen by IRIS and by OSHA. So when we inhale asbestos fiber, it causes lung cancer and mesothelioma, thanks to the other group who perfectly explained what are those. And yeah, exposure may also cause asbestosis. Uh, this is acute uh, problem. The asbestosis is more acute than a chronic case. So the symptoms again include cough, sharpness of breath, chest pain, and permanent damage. Sometimes it's a, it can, they can even have disability and death. We can see scarring of lung tissues too. And there is no safe level for asbestos exposure. Now this is a controversial line because some literatures say that there is, um, yeah, there is safe level of exposure of 1% of asbestos. But in general, asbestos is not good. We always aim for zero level. Uh, safe level should be zero is what our aim is. But just to achieve, we have some levels, but to generalize it, there is no safe level actually. Regulations to demolish asbestos by EPA. So now I'm going to start the example of saying how EPA demolishes asbestos. Mm -hmm. EPA Air Toxic Regulations for Asbestos is intended to reduce the discharge of asbestos fiber and um, keep the people, general population from the threat of asbestos fiber. So for this, they have an act called Clean Air Act. By this, they enforce and develop regulations to protect us from all kind of hazard pollutants. And in this case, it is asbestos. It is, of course, hazardous. So the section 112 of CAA establishes national emission standard for hazardous air pollutant. Hereafter called as NESHAP. So this is the regulation that we are going to see about. What, what does this regulation do is the basis that I would like to concise. So they actually work with the regulations um, of demolition and renovation. That is NESHAP. So asbestos NESHAP, I'm going to state it in four degrees. So four stages of demolition. The first stage is called as excavation. So excavation is simply digging or carefully removing the asbestos. So while doing this, we want to be sure that we don't you know, damage the asbestos in a way that uh, powder comes out. Sometimes machineries are used, so we have to be careful with that. We have to make sure it's not crumbled or broken in a way any kind of emission or fiber is being projected out. The second thing that we have to play, uh, pay attention to in excavation is there is a local exhaust ventilation and a collecting system while demolishing. So while stripping, stripping and removing the asbestos, we have to make sure that there is an exhaust ventilator and there are absorbing the um, equipments like thermal differential. So if we have those equipments to measure and to control the air pollution and the emission. And then the last one is a glove bag system. Like the picture that you see there is a glove bag system where they have gloves which has compartments and containers where they collect all the asbestos materials and dust and they seal it. So next uh, stage is storage. After removing the asbestos, what we have to do is we have to adequately strip, uh, adequately wet the strip asbestos. They do this to um, keep the asbestos from being um, polluting, like from keeping them from being emit emitting the unwanted fibers. And they call it a leak tight, uh, leak tight wrapping. This simply means that we wrap it tightly, like a, it's like an airtight container that we use for a meal, something like that, which completely closes and seals every side of asbestos in a way there is no leakage of any emittable particle. We do this before dismantling the asbestos. So there are some airtight discuss. And the third stage is transport. Transport is one of the most important um, aspect that must have pays attention to. So wrapped asbestos are transported to the wrecking site. Wrecking site is the disposal site. Mm -hmm. 
when you wrap and in containers, you're supposed to name it, label it, and say what are the hazardous content in it and what are the quantity of the hazardous content that is in it. And then, yeah, we have to have warning signs while loading and while unloading, also in the place where you're going to uh, dispose and uh, from the place where it is, everywhere we have to have signs to make the general public be cautious of what is being transported. So these are some signs and those are the transporting vehicles with signs in it. The last one is the ultimate disposal. So the main criteria by NESCAP is no visible emission. That is no active waste material from asbestos should be emitted. Now um, what do they do for this? Generally what they do is they take the all the asbestos containing waste material and they fill it in landfills and they do not just cover it. They cover uh, like the uh, asbestos containing material is down and on top of it they leave a layer of non asbestos containing material that could be that should be according to this regulation 15 cm and they recommend petroleum based um, coverage because this will help us to suppress the dust and even if there is a wind erosion it will not let the dust fly away so we put the asbestos down on a landfill and then they put a cover on top of it and then we close it so yeah, even here we have to have warning signs and you have to have fencing in the dismantling sites. You have to have fencing in a way that the general population will not get it. So, apart from these four stages, we have to notify the asbestos NESHA people at least before 45 days uh, of excavation. So, what, what should be mentioned in the notification? You have to mention the schedule starting and the completion dates of demolition. So why, why are you disturbing the waste material? Why are you going to demolish it? You have to mention a reason for it. So what are the procedures that you're going to use to control the emission that will be caused due to ex excavation, storage, transport, and final disposal? This is one of the important ones that they pay attention to as to what are the procedures that the removal people or the owners are going to take. And then we're going to see about, um, the next one is, uh -huh. The administrator who is going to supervise this process can give you suggestions to change the program that you have for controlling emissions. If your program is not good enough, they would give us suggestions to change it. Mm -hmm. And if you are going to store this asbestos in any local site, for example, if you are going to collect it in a local site and then take it to a place where you are going to finally dismantle it, you are supposed to uh, I mean, say the location of that temporary and the final site. So what are the records to be maintained? The owners of asbestos should always maintain a record called as waste shipment records and they should also submit a one copy of this to NESCAP administration. So what is waste shipment record? It is the general information. As simple as name, uh, address and the phone number, email ID of the owner and the name of the waste that is generated and how much asbestos containing waste material is present. And then we also say if in case there is a leakage, you are supposed to mention it. This leaked at this time and this much leaked, stuff like that. And where are you going to dispose it? And while, transport, uh, while transporting the asbestos, you have to have a certificate from the government regulation saying that this is all safe to travel through the highway. So that is the importance they give to this. Mm -hmm. This question I want to ask you. With one small factory in Ararat Valley, can asbestos be seriously a threat to Armenia? Because when they told this project about asbestos, I was thinking it was just one factory in, in a really far Mars, and how is that going to be a problem? So what do you think? It is a problem. Yeah, generally from other places, we know it is a problem. But in Armenia, with one factory? In our ways, we don't produce that much asbestos serves. But during Soviet time, it was a real big problem, which problem, because we were producing a huge amount of, a huge number of uh, asbestos tiles, and water pipes which were also containing asbestos. Right. Kind of right. But I was thinking what is this asbestos and I thought, um, okay let me take my camera today and I started from my house that's at Kanakir AUA dormitory and then I went to Moratsian hospital. So these are the things I found on the way. So this is two blocks away from my house and this is no rural place, this is center of the city, Erwin and goes on. And, on. and this is the turning to the Moratsian hospital and this one on top is completely asbestos. It's a well maintained building but with asbestos cover. This is from my hospital and the hospital is in center with kids all around and there is general population playing and there is asbestos everywhere. This, this. 
If you see, there is damaged asbestos here. Now, it's not intact, and this is the same condition in almost every place. They say that asbestos is safe and it's intact, but actually, it is partially in a demolished place. And people are not so sure economically stable enough to replace all this or remove all this. Mm, yeah, this is straight down. So, these are the things I saw. And I had an informal interview with one of a person who, uh, in an office, who removes asbestos. And I asked him, is there, if they have any regulations that regulates them to remove asbestos. They were like, no, we take uh, uh, special measures to keep it airtight and we have our own procedures to do it. But then, I, from what I learned from is, is they don't have a proper regulation or a proper system or a proper legislation that is like controlling them. They do it after their personal um, extra efforts, maybe. Mm -hmm. Asbestos containing material is something that contains more than 1% of asbestos. So, NESHAP regulates the, uh, the regulations applied by NESHAP applies to the roof which contains more than 1% of asbestos containing material. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have to be, we have to make sure that when you scrap off or when you remove the asbestos, there should be no, oh, these are regulations for roof removal operations. How do we remove the roof? So there should be uh, extra attention paid to not to break or crumble any shillings or to make the shillings into powder. Nothing of that should be done. And notification should of course be given to demolishing uh, of demolishing to NSAP previously. And requirements to adequately wet. Adequately wetting, I told you, right? We wet the asbestos before we transport it. And collect all the dust, debris, air emissions, and everything. And they have to be stored in leak tight containers. And warning signs must be placed, as I told earlier, in transporting vehicles, the uh, disposing site everywhere. And the shipment records are to be maintained. For roof removals, at least one trained uh, supervisor should supervise them according to NESHAP regulations. Asbestos is not regulated by legislation. This is what um, it has been said in the meeting that was conducted for the human and financial burden of asbestos in WHO European region as of 2012. And uh, in the informal interviews also I learned that there is no particular asbestos that has been regulated by regulation. Apart from producing, still asbestos are being imported. Recommendation. So what I learned was the only thing that could be done in this area, in asbestos area, is by public health professionals. Because I also learned in a paper that environmental courses are being conducted to students for them to be aware of asbestos and steps to be taken towards controlling it. So these are the immediate, the first step that we are taking to control asbestos. So what else could be done? I don't know if it is viable, but it looks like NESHAP has very interesting ways of demolishing and if you go check their site and check the rules that they have, they have so many rules to control every single aspect of demolishment. So it would be good for us to follow what they follow. I don't know if it will be viable, but it makes sense that if we demolish things like this, it gives us less risk for the public population because I think Armenia is at need. If, if the center of Armenia is highly covered with asbestos everywhere, uh, there's no question about rural areas. So I think it would be good for me to recommend to follow these basic rules by Armenia. Any questions or comments? Pretty much that's it. Informal interview conductor. So it's just, I went to a website and at Babayan Street there was um, remove, uh, that, there is a removal place where if you go to them and if you, if you say that you want to remove your asbestos, they remove it in a very cautious way. So I just went with my friend and I had a normal talk with them. And that What's day, the name of this organization? I have to check. I just saw the address and there was a person who spoke English, so I just talked with them normally. In Baba Street. Street. How did you find it? Sorry. In general. But like, what did you type to find them? Asbestos removal in Edinburgh. Okay. So you talked about NESHPA regulations. Uh, are there any specific regulations for roof removal? Uh, it's it is called as asbestos NESHPA. Mm -hmm. And in asbestos NESHPA, they have separate legislation uh, for the roof removal. Like the same things, but What's they... What's the main difference? Mm -hmm. Sorry. 
the for the removing of the the cemented uh, uh, asbestos containing material they have regulations which says that in a, in a paragraph it comes like the heavy machineries should not be used to make the shillings into powder and those were extra things that were there. but there was not pretty much more but I thought it's interesting to repeat it again because I saw a lot of proofs there so mm -hmm. but I'm not really sure of what is the main difference. but there was extra emphasis on the removing part and what's the relationship between the Clean Air Act and the Snesh Bar Regulation? In the Clean Air Act, they develop and they enforce law. And under the Clean Air Act, this Snesh Bar was this Snesh Bar was um, regulated. Just a second. Go to the first page. Do home. Click on home. So, what's your answer? Uh -huh. In sexual section one one two of CAA, they established this. Um, rule called as NESHAP, which is National Emission Standard for Hazardous Air Pollutants. Under this, they have a uh, regulation called Asbestos NESHAP. This regulates all the asbestos related um, problems. Okay, thank you. Question? Other question? Thanks. Okay.